So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And I can see that we have a wonderfully full house. So this is really lovely to see everybody. I'd like to invite everybody who's kind of still looking for a seat to let you know that you don't have to be the shy students. There's some room in the front row and some single <laughs> seats that you can feel free to take, take up. My name is Bettina Palkazmarov, and as you can see, for obvious reasons, I don't do podiums, so you're going to get me at the front of the room. And I'm one of the four co-chairs for Carleton Strategic Integrated Planning Task Force. I'd like to also recognize two of our other co-chairs who are with us today. We have Patrice Smith, and we have over here, because I was kind of blocking, Lorraine Dyke, and our fourth, fourth co-chair, Cindy Taylor, who was not able to join us for the event today. With us today, we have faculty, staff, students, and board members, and we'd like to thank you all. We also have members of our newly created Strategic Integrated Planning Task Force, who are going to be integral to the success of the planning process. So I'd like to take a moment just to thank you all for joining us and to welcome you all today. We are also pleased to host this event as part of our strategic planning speaker series. These events are meant to prompt us all to think about the strategically about specific topics related to our planning process. It's designed to allow us to think broadly and creatively about where we're going. The strategic planning process is broad and consultative, and we have planned several ways for you to engage and share your feedback, comments, and ideas. One of the ways that we're going to be doing this is through a Canadian technology that we've engaged called QuickShare. And we're excited to share this with you today. So QuickShare is actually quite easy to use. What we need to do, is if you're techie, if you could pull out your phones and actually scan the QR code on the screen, you'll be taken directly to the, the QuickShare website, or you can feel free to enter the code at the bottom of the screen, the 693 number, at the website given there, spannareva.com forward slash QS. What you should see at that point is a post-it note. Does everybody see a post-it note who's given it a try? We really love it. We think it's very cool. Um, so once you've done that, if you'd like to just see how the software works, you can enter up to five lines of text. And what we're going to ask you to do now, just to try it out, is to actually just enter your role on campus. So for example, I would enter faculty as an example. But feel free to get creative if you like. And we should see some of those popping up for the people who are monitoring it in the back. We're not actually going to post it on the screen, so it's not distracting once we get started. And so once you've done that, what you can see is that at any point during the panel today, you can feel free to add your ideas. And what we have is we have somebody available to curate those ideas, sort them for us, and they'll come back and we'll make them more public during the question and answer part of the, the session today. So we're going to give this a try. And with that in mind, it is now my pleasure to introduce our President and Vice Chancellor, Benoit Antoine Bacon, who's going to provide us with the land acknowledgement and some opening remarks. Benoit? Bonjour tout le monde. It's, it's, great, it's great to see uh, a full house uh, for our event today. And uh, I, I, I do want to start by acknowledging that the land on which we gather today, the land on which Carlton is situated, is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Uh, thanks again for being here. This is the second event uh, in our strategic uh, planning lecture series. Ken Steele was here uh, for the launch uh, last week. Uh, today, a great panel on uh, internationalization. So what I'll say is thank you, thank you for caring uh, about uh, strategic planning uh, and about uh, Carlton. L Lorraine will provide a, a much more fulsome introduction, but I do want to acknowledge uh, our three speakers, uh, Paul Davidson uh, of Universities Canada. Great to see you, Paul. Uh, Lorraine, uh, <clears throat> Karen Dalkey uh, from uh, CBIE, great to see you. And uh, Greg Moran from uh, Academics uh, Without Borders, former provost of uh, Western and Aga Khan. Thank you, all three of you, for being here uh, today. Planning matters, turns out. <laughs> it does. It does. Over time, whatever you lay down uh, it, in those plans become our reality. Uh, so it, it's, it behooves us all uh, to be involved, to participate, to put our input uh, into the plan. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at the past strategic plan, everything that was in there became realized 
in 2025 and 2030 uh, when the great people uh, that will still be here and, and that I will have joined the, the community will look at our plan, they'll say, oh my God, great plan and great, uh, uh, great realizations. Uh, by our community. So thank you for being part of the process. We're, we're building on strength in so many ways. Uh, over 31,000 students on campus today, uh, the biggest that we've ever been. 12% of our undergraduates are international students, oh, just over 20% of our grad students. So uh, that tells you right away that uh, internationalization, globalization uh, matters. Uh, international Mobility, uh, one thing I always say when government want to talk about experiential learning is that if you consider outcomes uh, an international experience uh, ticks all the box of an experiential learning uh, uh, experience. And, and then of course international research. Uh, we're, we're just coming out of uh, the greatest year of research funding in Carleton's history. Uh, and next year will be even bigger. Where's Rafiq? Yeah, there he, <laughs> there he is. No pressure. You, you noted that, Rafiq, yeah. Uh, and a big part of that, increasingly, will be international collaborations and uh, going after large, uh, in, in multidisciplinary international uh, grants. So, so, so much uh, to talk about. Uh, I'm excited uh, to hear our three panelists. Uh, thank you again for caring about strategic planning and for being here uh, today, and uh, enjoy the event. Thank you, uh, Benoit and Bettina. Um, as Bettina said, I'm Lorraine Dyke, and uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Strategic Integrated Planning Task Force. It's my great pleasure today to introduce our speakers. As we've heard from Benoit already, uh, internationalization, a global perspective on universities is really essential in today's environment. We, are, we have increasing numbers of international students on our campuses. We have uh, more initiatives to send our students abroad. Uh, the Government of Canada recently announced a five-year plan to invest $30 million to diversify our international recruitment and post-secondary education. They've also allocated $95 million for study abroad initiatives for domestic students. And these are all part of a broader initiative to expand international recruitment and study abroad uh, the, of $148 million. So clearly, uh, we're in an environment where this matters deeply, as Benoit has said, and our speakers today are going to share with us some of the challenges and opportunities that that global engagement entails. So it's my pleasure now to introduce those guest speakers, starting with Paul Davidson on my uh, far left. Uh, Paul is the President and CEO of Universities Canada. He's plays, played leadership roles in government, the private sector, and the voluntary sector for over 25 years. In 2009, Paul joined Universities Canada as President and CEO, where he leads a team dedicated to advancing higher education, research, and innovation for the benefit of Canadians. Prior to this, Paul was the Executive Director of the World University Service of Canada, which is a leading international development agency active on 70 campuses across Canada and 17 countries overseas. He holds an MA from Queen's University, where he studied, studied Southern African history, and a BA from Trent University, where he was the first class of the Trent International Program. So please join me in welcoming Paul. Thank you. Next to Paul is Karen Delkey. She's the Vice President of Development and Partnerships at the Canadian Bureau of International Education. She joined CBIE in 1998 and has spearheaded and implemented many projects and initiatives around the world over the past 20 years. She has provided strategic oversight to the implementation of projects funded by Global Affairs Canada and foreign clients and is responsible for developing new partnership and development initiatives for the organization with a wide range of international and Canadian partners across government, academia and civil society. She has a strong command of French, Spanish, Russian, and Ukrainian. I'm very impressed and jealous. Um, and has worked extensively in the former Soviet Union, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Karen is a Carleton graduate. <laughs> she holds an MA in International Affairs and a Teaching English Language Certificate from Carleton, and a BA in History and Russian from the University of Manitoba. She has also studied in Moscow at the Moscow State Pedagogical University. So please join me in welcoming Karen. And then last but not at all least is Greg Moran. He's the executive director, as Benoit mentioned, of Academics Without Borders. 
He previously worked as Director of Special Projects at the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, or HECO as most of, it, of us know it, uh, for two years. Greg served as the Provost and Chief Academic Officer of Aga Khan University from 2011 to 2015 and was based in Nairobi, Kenya for three of those years. Aga Khan University is an international institution that operates in eight countries on three continents with campuses in Pakistan, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, England, and Afghanistan. We thought our jobs were challenging. <laughs> he holds a BSc in psychology from McGill and an MA and PhD degrees in psychology from Dalhousie University. He is Professor Emeritus and Provost Emeritus at Western University, where he held an appointment as Provost from 1977 to 2015. Um, held an appointment, I should say. Um, please join me in welcoming Greg. Ten years is <laughs> so I'm now going to call on Paul to start off our panel. Each of our speakers will speak for a few minutes, and then we will have questions. You've already seen the Quick Share technology, so please post your questions on Quick Share, and then uh, we'll moderate the discussion from there. Great. Thank you very much. What a pleasure to be with you. Let me echo the acknowledgement of the land that was offered and just share that I was very pleased to spend a week uh, with Benoit in Yukon Territory earlier this summer to learn about the situation there and how reconciliation can be put into action in post-secondary education. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be with you today and with, with, a, with a fine group of panelists. I'm going to try to constrain my remarks so that there's lots of opportunity for, for questions and dialogue. But let me begin by saying that the question of internationalization of universities or globalization is really close to my heart. In fact, it informed my decision in 1983 where to study. Because in those days, Trent University was one of the first to offer a year abroad program for every student. So it's been a, a, a cause of great interest for uh, 35 years now. Let me start with my central premise, that this is Canada's moment, that we have an opportunity to make great strides right now, and that if you look back over the last 50 years, you will see that universities have moved from serving primarily their local communities, primarily as undergraduate universities, to becoming comprehensive universities, research universities, globally leading research universities, and now there's an opportunity for Canadian universities to be truly globally engaged, serving communities locally, nationally, and around the world. My hope and my vision for universities in Canada over the next 10 years is that every university thinks of everything it does in global terms. It's no longer good enough to just think about the 50 kilometers around us. In fact, until quite recently, one of the metrics that the province of Ontario used was to say, how, what percentage of students can get their entire education within 50 kilometers of home? And I say in the 21st century, that's not good enough. We have to be global in everything we're thinking and doing. One of the challenges is that we're doing this against a backdrop of unprecedented disruption. You know that if you're a faculty member, you know that if you're a student or an administrative leader, that the world is not the way we thought it would be even a few short years ago. Let me leave one fact that I hope will stay in your brain uh, beyond this hour, and that is that in the United States, over 50% of Americans, the general public, believe that universities are contributing to the decline of America. <laughs> Think about what that means. Think about what the last 70 years has meant in the United States in the post-war period about the investment in higher education, the investment in research, its world-leading standards, its, its uh, growth and, and quality of life. And now uh, half of Americans believe that universities are contributing to the decline of America. We have a challenge, all of us, to maintain trust and confidence in the value of post-secondary education, not only to individual students, but also to communities and, uh, and to the publics that we serve. And that's just one thread of disruption. Uh, think for a moment of your colleagues in the UK who are facing Brexit. I think it's true to say that Cambridge University will lose 150 million pounds a year in research income as a result of Brexit. A completely self-inflicted wound, but that's a political editorial comment about <laughs> Brexit. So we're, we're facing a new and more challenging world, and uh, to do that we should pause for a moment to look about where we've been and then turn to where we're going. You know, as was described in, the, in my bio and in Karen's bio and in Craig's bio, many of us got involved 
in the era of capacity building, of taking the capacities of Canadian universities and sharing that in, in other parts of the world. Whereas now we're engaged much more in a, in a, a dialogue of partnership and engaged in, a, in, a, in a, a method of partnership with institutions around the world. And then for a number of years, when, you, when people thought about university internationalization, they thought exclusively of student recruitment and where we bring students from around the world. And that continues to be very important to the future of universities in Canada. And just again, to give uh, uh, an illustration of the growth of that and the impact of international students uh, on, Canadian, on the Canadian economy. When I first arrived at Universities Canada about 10 years ago, it was estimated that the impact of international students to the economy in Canada was $8.6 billion a year. Two weeks ago, uh, new figures were released. Same study, same researcher, same methodology. International students contribute over $22 billion a year to Canada's economy. That's bigger than softwood. That's bigger than wheat. That's as big as auto parts. And it's distributed right across the country in communities large and small. Now, I know some of you will say, please don't boil it down just to economic impact. But we have to reflect on what that means for Canada as a country and, and going further, talking about what the opportunities are for uh, uh, knowledge exchange, brain gain, brain chain, and making sure there's a flow of students in both directions. So if we started at capacity building and moved into student recruitment, and then the next phase, because our research capacity has been enhanced over the last 20 years, who do we partner with globally? And Canadians can be really proud. Uh, Canadian faculty members are amongst the most collaborative in the world. If you look at all the leading indicators of uh, international research co-publications, we far outperform our, our international counterparts in terms of collaborative work. I'll speak about some of the challenges of that in a moment. And then most recently, the work we've been doing at Universities Canada has been trying to help our members navigate this disruptive global world. And so we have a regular dialogue with university presidents from the United States and from Europe. We are engaged with our counterparts in Washington, in Australia, in the UK, in Germany, and across Europe to try to understand best practices and best approaches to these emerging challenges. So let's talk about some of those challenges. On the recruitment front, uh, Carleton has done extremely well in terms of increasing its number of international students. Um, one of the challenges we're seeing uh, right across the country is how to diversify the number of countries from which we draw students. Uh, at a national level, over half of all international students come from just two countries. And so what I'd hope we will be able to see in the next few years is a broadening of that base, a more balanced uh, uh, set of source, sources for those international students. Now we're starting from a very strong position. Canada is known for academic excellence. It's known for its high quality. It's known for its affordability. And it's known for being safe, secure, and welcoming. And in that global context right now, we're known for being open, for being dynamic, and being progressive. And that are, those are very strong attributes uh, to, uh, to our international recruitment efforts. And as was mentioned in the introduction, we're pleased to see the federal government has a new international education strategy that will help us all identify promising new places for, uh, for attracting international students uh, to Canada. Let me shift for a moment um, into uh, the research domain. And let me say that my hope for Canada and for the Canadian public policy environment uh, in the years to come is that we are able to have a multi-year sustained commitment to international research collaboration that crosses party lines. You'll see that in Germany, all the major parties have committed to a 10-year forecast of research funding. And so they're not having to worry about, oh, there may be a change in government or a change in coalition. It is absolutely foundational that research is integral to the, uh, to the strength and health of, uh, of the German economy and German society. So that's my hope. And there have been some modest uh, measures of late to uh, really uh, um, capitalize on Canada's uh, research moment with the new frontiers and, and research fund that's been developed. I still think we need to raise our uh, ambition higher uh, Europe is in the final stages of designing its next seven-year plan for research, the European community. Up until now, Canada has been a very modest player in those exercises. Enough money to have a conference, enough money to get to know researchers, but our apparatus does not fit with uh, the global research environment and opportunities to participate meaningfully 
in major global research challenges. And of course, there's no shortage of global challenges, whether it's migration or climate change, or I could go on and on about the global challenges we need to face. So could Canada think about being a full partner in Horizons Europe, the next seven-year program of the European research community? Or in the Brexit context, the UK is reaching out to try to establish new relationships, and Australia is reaching out to new relationships. Is it possible to think of a new global research partnership that would include those countries in a way that's meaningful? And how do we maintain our relationships uh, with, uh, with the US, who are our largest research partners uh, and will be for some time to come? I will touch briefly on, on uh, one of the more uh, recent challenges in this disrupted world is we believe passionately in the value of the diplomacy of knowledge. We believe passionately in uh, researchers having the academic freedom to pursue research wherever it takes them. We defend strongly institutions' autonomy to pursue their own uh, priorities. And yet we're working in a context of new geopolitical realities. And so how do we navigate uh, questions of uh, uh, international participation in Canadian research and where do the benefits of that research flow. And I'll just say that Rafiq has played a national leadership role in thinking this through with us and with others and so thank you to Rafiq for that. Let me start to close by speaking about the, the new outbound mobility opportunity that lies before us. This is something that, as I say, I've been keen about since about 1983 and a number of people in this room have been helpful in getting us to this point. But in the spring budget, the government committed, federal government committed to a new international education uh, strategy, which included, for the first time, a pan-Canadian outbound student mobility program. Uh, this is something we've been working on for a long time because of the transformative effects of international experience uh, during your undergraduate years. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about this new program, it's going to commit about $95 million over the next five years. Um, and it, they've, they've put down two parameters which I think are really helpful to think about because it sends a broader signal beyond this one program. Mm -hmm. It's how do we ensure that students that wouldn't normally think of themselves as going abroad, how do we make sure that they get abroad? And so people with disabilities, indigenous students, those from low or modest incomes, how do we take the barriers away? And they're not just financial barriers. They're issues of credit recognition. They're issues of, of course programming. How do you make sure that students don't think it's too complicated, it's too expensive, it's going to prolong my course of study? How do we integrate it into our curricula in a way that's meaningful and exciting? The second element, the second parameter of this new outbound program is it's placing an emphasis on new destinations and new partnerships. Because Canadians actually are less mobile than Americans, Germans, the Brits, and, and uh, French. We are actually less mobile. And to the extent we study abroad, we study in the United States, the UK, and Australia. That's fine. But how do we grow new destinations that reflect some of the new directions of, of, of the world? So those are, those are a few elements that I wanted to throw into the conversation today as you think about uh, Carleton's strategy going forward. And let me close by just saying, first of all, the idea of a university developing a strategic plan is an ambitious thought in itself. And I, I don't think anyone expects everyone to move in lockstep with the strategic plan. But it is a very useful exercise to think about the challenges and the opportunities before you. I think this, if I can illustrate a, a story about this, something to keep in mind is what time frame are you working on? Um, one of the pleasures of my job is I, I get to uh, serve in an advisory capacity to the Global Center for Pluralism. The Global Center for Pluralism is an initiative of His Highness the Aga Khan, who uh, contributed a sum of money and built a beautiful center uh, in the old war museum in downtown Ottawa. He pulled his board of directors together uh, for a retreat and to think about a strategic plan for the Global Center for Pluralism. And he commissioned staff to say, give us a mid-term mid forecast on where you think the center is going. And the staff said, absolutely, your highness, we'll, we'll develop that. Give us some guidance. What does medium term mean to you? He said, start at 50 years. 50 years. Can you imagine trying to project what the world is gonna look like in 50 years? But his point was that if you are building institutions that are going to last, your time frames have to work on different scales. Now, I'm not suggesting this strategic plan needs to be for 50 years. <laughs> But I do, <laughs> but it reminds us to raise our sights beyond this quarter or this government or this 
political period that we happen to be in and remember the enduring values of universities that have seen us live and survive, prosper and contribute since the Middle Ages. It's not that we're resistant to change. It's actually that we're quite innovative, dynamic and responsive to the needs around us. So I wish you well in your work and I'd be happy to engage in conversation after my colleagues have had a moment to speak. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite Karen to share her insights. Well, first of all, let me <clears throat> thank Carleton University for the invitation to be part of this um, panel presentation and, and part of your strategic planning exercise. Um, CBI really appreciates that opportunity and we have had a very close relationship with Carleton University and I'll highlight a bit of that in my presentation and we look forward to continuing and deepening that engagement moving forward. Um, Oh, I can look that way. Okay. So uh, just a few words first about CBIE for those that may not be aware of the Canadian Bureau for International Education. We were founded um, over 50 years ago in 1966 and we are the only national membership association that is exclusively dedicated to international education. Um, our membership regroups the entire spectrum of the Canadian education system, meaning school boards, colleges, universities, polytechnics, SEGEPs, etc. And our really mandate is to promote international education in its most broadest sense and to assist our member institutions in expanding their educational partnerships across Canada and, and the between Canada and, and countries across the globe. Just, um, we have over 150 members over the past 30 years. Um, we've managed uh, approximately over 100 programs and projects valued at over $2 billion. Um, as I mentioned, we, were, we just celebrated a few years ago our 50th anniversary. Um, and one of the mainstays of our activities is in scholarship management and the mo in inbound and outbound mobility of students. And over the course of those years, I think we've counted about 35,000 students have sort of gone through CBI's doors. This is just a snapshot of our members, and I'm sure you'll be able to find Carlton there on that, uh, on that list. Oh, there it is in the top right-hand corner. Um, I will focus most of my discussion or comments today about um, CBIE and the work that we're doing and the work that we're doing with Carleton and um, perhaps give some food for thought um, as you embark on, on your strategic plan. But I wanted to echo some of Paul's comments and um, in terms of setting the context first of international education and the state of that in Canada. Um, Currently, I, the recent data is showing that as of 2018, it was, as was announced in the in, in International Education Strategy, there are over 700,000 students, international students, studying in Canada at all levels of study. Um, and this means that our international education landscape in Canada is much, much different than it was about 10 years ago uh, when there were just under uh, 100,000 at that time. So we have seen exponential growth in the sector in terms of international students coming onto our campuses. As Paul mentioned, again, the latest statistics report that international, that the expenditures by international students on in Canada amount to over 21 $1.6 billion to Canada's GDP. Another fact about the international student presence in Canada is that over 50%, almost 55% of those students are, are concentrated in Canada's three gateway cities, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. Um, I think it's understandable that international students per perhaps want to study in those places that the only sort of three cities that perhaps they've ever heard of in Canada, um, but that does pose the question or the challenge to Canada as a whole in terms of, yes, they bring a tremendous benefit, um, economic benefit, um, a real intellectual benefit, you know, to our campuses, but there is a need to distribute those benefits more equitably across the country, and particularly those regions and smaller urban centres that are facing significant challenges as their population ages faster than the national average and traditional manufacturing and agriculture jobs are disappearing. 
Um, as Paul mentioned as well, over 50% of international students coming to Canada is coming from two countries, China and India. Um, and I think this has proven increasingly risky for Canadian institutions, especially when our educational institutions are increasingly finding themselves in the center of and impacted by geopolitical developments and diplomatic disputes that are beyond their control. And if I reference, of course, the, our current relationship with China, I think it was Moody's credit agency that had already warned that if political tensions between Canada and China worsen, this could pose a real risk for Canadian universities. Again, so something to think about. Again, as Paul had alluded to um, and mentioned that one of the key elements of Canada's newly released international education strategy um, is the diversification of countries from which international students come to Canada, as well as their fields, level of study, and program of st location of study. By 2030, emerging, emerging economies will account for about 50% of global GDP. And while China will be, continue to be the single biggest contributor to global growth, another five Asian economies will be among the world's fast, six fastest growing economies. Bangladesh, India, Philippines, Pakistan, and Vietnam. And this supports the IRCC data that shows that the fastest growing countries in 2018 for sending students to Canada were those that were on the screen. So while these countries currently have a low market share, uh, except of course for India, their national strategies to target the growth of the middle class may likely provide a new welcome source of students for Canadian institutions who are proactively seeking to uh, reduce their reliance on one or two markets. Some comments about future considerations. Um, you know, as more countries recognize that, um, that international students represent important sources of revenue and human capital, and as greater number of people uh, worldwide can afford to study abroad, the sector has become increasingly competitive. Not only are Canada's traditional competitors, such as Australia, France, Germany, New Zealand, and the United, the United Kingdom, and the United States, investing more in their marketing of international uh, or their educational offerings, but new emerging markets and developing nations, particularly in Asia, are becoming more attractive to prospective international students. Asian higher education systems are strengthening and we are seeing universities in China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia ranking among the world's best. As such, the unprecedented growth that in student numbers coming to Canada cannot be um, taken for granted over the long run. And so while international students really represent an opportunity, a unique opportunity for Canadian institutions, there are significant responsibilities that come with such growth. Um, the, sheer, the current reality is that the sheer numbers of international students on our campuses is changing the landscape of the campuses. And as Canadian institutions absorb greater numbers of students, so too does the level of responsibility increase um, to ensure that their a quality educational is experience is delivered for all. And ensuring that quality educational experience is the responsibility of a multitude of stakeholders across an institution. It, in, it ranges from the senior administrators, the faculty members, and staff within the international offices, within the student services offices, the housing offices, those are just to name a few. So it's in recognition of those institutional capacity building needs of the frontline workers, of the strategic thinkers and within an institution to ensure the prov provision of a quality educational experience that CBIE is um, developing and delivering services targeted to our member institutions to support that effort. And I will get into those in just a few minutes. Um, just a quick note that um, CBIE on a regular basis does conduct um, surveys of the international student populations. Our last survey was done in 2018. The pr prior to that, we had conducted a survey in 2015, and it is a unique national data set which provides critical, holistic insights on the international student experience in Canada's post-secondary institutions. 
in a few uh, findings from that 2018 um, survey, we were delighted that 40, we had a very high response rate, 46 uh, post-secondary institutions uh, participate, uh, pers participated, sorry, and all 10 provinces were represented. We received over 14,000 complete usable responses, and that represents an increase of about 253 percent from uh, 2015, making it by far the most robust data set um, on post-secondary international edu student experience in Canada, and it is frequently re uh, referenced in government publications, publications by policy think tanks and other organizations. These were some of the themes that we had touched on in that 2018 survey. Um, following that survey and in recognition of the very, very low number of Canadians, as Paul had mentioned, that go to study abroad, um, in 2016 we had uh, conducted uh, Canada's first national survey um, looking at the status of outbound mobility of Canadian students. And those are some of the findings from that survey, um, again, reflecting, as Paul had mentioned, where the top destinations uh, for our students. Um, and at that point, I mean, the numbers fluctuate in terms of the percentage, according to our calculations, it was 2.3% of university students going um, abroad, and that is um, the lowest among the OECD countries. Um, the findings of C CBIE's study uh, were further reinforced by a report of the study group on global education in 2017, co-led by the University of Ottawa and the University of Toronto, which shone light on Canada's need for a more strategic and ambitious approach to global education. And again, key barriers consistently identified across reports and through consultations included the cost of studying outside of Canada and difficulties in transferring credits uh, earned at educational uh, institutions abroad. So the result of that survey were the impetus for the Learning Beyond Borders campaign um, that sought to engage Canadian education institutions at all levels to get involved in the national conversation on learning abroad and become champions for change. And over 90 of our member institutions supported this campaign with communication and programs. And that uh, program um, sort of culminated in a May 2017 roundtable uh, that was hosted at Rideau Hall by the Governor General, um, then His Excellency the Right Honourable David Johnston, um, where we engaged leaders from across government, business, education institutions and youth about how learning abroad can help support Canada's global engagement. And we're really delighted to see the fruits of those efforts uh, together with those of, you know, many other organizations, including those on the panel today. Um, and as Paul alluded to, that $95 million, uh, com dollar, uh, million dollar commitment um, that was recently announced in, in um, the inter new international education strategy. So a few words about CBIE within that context. Um, some, some of our key member services are listed here, um, and I'll go into a, into a few of those in greater detail as, as I move forward. Um, again, we have our annual conference, which will be in Winnipeg this year, um, and uh, we have our re regional meetings, and we are very pleased that Carleton co-hosted that regional meeting last year uh, for Ontario. Um, we have awards of excellence, scholarship management uh, programs, international project and partnership opportunities. Um, we conduct research, professional development, advisory committees, and also professional learning communities. Um, primarily, our, we work very closely with all levels um, of stakeholders across given, a given institution, uh, ranging really from the frontline workers up until uh, up to the offices of the vice presidents and presidents' offices. So in terms of our scholarship management portfolio, we administer scholarships uh, on behalf of the Canadian government and foreign governments across the world. Um, these are some of exa some examples of our current scholarship program. Um, 
we manage the Libyan North American Scholarship Program um, on behalf of the Libyan government that sends Libyan students at all levels of study to Canada and the United States. And uh, there are 17 students currently here at Carleton uh, studying under that program. We manage on behalf of, the Glo of Global Affairs Canada the International Scholarships Program, which is comprised of about 14 sub-programs which include ELAP, the Emerging Leaders of the Americas program, and uh, there are eight uh, ELAP students coming to Carleton uh, for the 2019-2020 year. Um, two, under SEED, um, which is the Scholarship and Educational Exchanges for Development program. And what I'd like to mention here is your two students are from Myanmar. Um, and there are only three students out of the entire SEED program that are from Myanmar, um, which I think is wonderful. Uh, so I would really like to commend Carleton on that because um, under SEED we see a lot of applications coming from Philippines, a lot in Vietnam. And we are, we would like to, and Global Affairs Canada would like to um, see the, the likes of Myanmar, um, Cambodia, Laos increase at their profile in this program. And the fact that you have two students there, so I applaud you for that, and perhaps we might uh, want to connect later in terms of how you've sort of made that work um, in that more challenging con context. Um, and then you have one recipient, um, it's a Carleton student that's in China right now, uh, under the Canada-China Scholarship Exchange Program. He is studying uh, Chinese language in China, and he was one of the first to get on the plane um, and to embark on his educational experience. So again, the numbers under that program have been a little bit more tenuous this year especially, but uh, congratulations to you. And we have the African Leaders of Tomorrow program, um, whereby um, students from Africa are placed across the country and doing their graduate studies, master's programs, and other public policy finance or administration. So there is one here at Carleton right now. As Paul mentioned, um, as well, a lot of our efforts um, in the early days of our organizations uh, were you know, focused on international capacity building. Certain, certainly CBIE over the past few decades has been very, very engaged in that uh, endeavor, focused primarily in the former Soviet Union, uh, where we uh, developed and delivered many capacity building programs, in, primarily in the areas of public administration reform, civil society development, human resource development, and now legal aid reform. And again, I would like to point out really the critical role that Carleton faculty members played in that endeavor. Um, I will mention a few names, Les Powell, Catherine Graham, uh, Pauline Rankin, just to name a few. In When Ukraine became newly independent and CBIE began our engagement in Ukraine, through the efforts um, of those individuals, along with a few colleagues from Dalhousie University, we helped to establish the National Academy of Public Administration in Ukraine. Um, they worked to develop the new, the first ever master's program in public administration in, in Ukraine that is still being offered today. Um, we then uh, expanded those efforts into work in the Caucasus regions, into Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Um, so I think that uh, not only did they bring Carleton's expertise um, and their own uh, expertise to the region, but I can only imagine the impact that that had on the students that they were teaching in their classrooms as they brought back that experience uh, to their own classrooms and campuses. Um, currently, CBIE is implementing two pro capacity building programs in Jordan and in Ukraine. Um, you see them listed there, but I would like to mention that again, Carleton is involved um, uh, through Pauline Rankin. Um, we're doing a lot of work on gender mainstreaming with the Ministry of Education in Jordan, and also a social innovation and entrepreneurship course with the University of Ottawa and Hashemite University in Jordan is in the process of being um, developed and implemented in Jordan. Um, and so that is being co-branded between Carleton and the University of Ottawa. Um, certainly, you know, international education on our campuses is not just about international student recruitment. So we, CBIE has launched an international collaboration mission series 
the goal of this series is to enable our member institutions to expand, to learn about partnership opportunities uh, with other countries, with other like-minded institutions across the globe. And there is the list of the different countries that we've been to, and I'd like to highlight the ones that are underlined are the ones where Carleton has participated. And we're delighted uh, that our upcoming mission to Colombia, uh, timed around the CAE conference, um, we will have Carlos from Carleton who will be participating on that mission and we've received some really positive feedback about these missions in terms of just providing greater understanding exposure um, to uh, again another country context another system and connecting with other institutions um, I'll just really quickly move forward on this um, CBIE in recognition of the fact, as I had mentioned earlier, of the capacity building, the competency building needs that institutions face um, from a wide range of stakeholders. We have a number of professional development offerings. Um, we offer a series of webinars uh, for international educational profess um, professionals, um, again, designed to increase their competencies. And we conduct um, some faculty and staff training. These are two examples <laughs> of pieces of our current offering. Um, the first program is our RECIA programming, and we do have a, a participant from Carleton on that program. Um, and the, these, this program is designed to prepare international student advisors to become regulated international student immigration advisors. And uh, we're also piloting um, a faculty and staff program, a uh, staff training program um, to address the challenges of internationalization and to maximize the opportunities of internationalization. This pilot program is targeted to faculty and staff at a particular um, institution in the East Coast. And depending on sort of how the, the roll of, rollout of that program, we will seek to be uh, looking to per perhaps offer that to um, country or institutions across the country. Um, what we've heard from our member institutions that what a particularly valuable service is the opportunity for international education professionals to connect with each other and um, in that space we do have professional learning communities that are offered online um, and uh, up until now they have been operating primarily through listservs but we're really excited that as of November we will be launching a uh, sort of a, quite a, a modern and very interactive uh, online forum where there will be the opportunity for members to share knowledge, resources, act, um, access a library and uh, participate in live uh, chats. Two minutes, great, I'm almost done. <laughs> and uh, we do have our international network of tomorrow's leaders that are targeted to new professionals in the area of international education. Um, Carleton was a participant of the INTL uh, in 2018, as well as being a mentor uh, for new professionals coming into that space. We have our Immigration Advisory Committee, which is chaired by CBIE. And it was established back in 1994 um, to work with both with CBI and Citizenship and Immigration Canada to attempt to resolve the many um, issues um, around immigration and um, visa processing. Um, as you know, as we were becoming more and more aware of the challenges being faced by particularly international students trying to come to Canada, this committee was established. Um, CBIE has, as I mentioned, we have our student survey. We have conducted uh, research um, over the past few years, or past few decades, sorry. Um, and this is an area that we would like to move into, and we envision moving into in a much more um, proactive way moving forward with our new strategic plan. Um, there certainly ha there are a lot of data gaps um, that you know we hear about from and from our member institutions, from government officials, and we feel that that is a space that we would like to move into, so stay tuned for that. Um, these are some of the reports that we've pre prepared. Um, I've, you know, we've referenced the survey data. We have mission reports that are coming out of our collaboration mission series, um, as well as our sort of more general research. 
and this is again uh, where we would like to go um, and in terms of moving forward and in terms of in incubating, um, curating and, and sharing that pan-Canadian data. With that, I will close um, again with mention that our conference will be held in, in um, November of this year. It really is the go-to place on international education in Canada. Um, we expect over nine, you know, traditionally we get between 800 and 900 uh, representatives from across the sector and it really is a unique opportunity uh, to connect with your peers um, and to learn more about the state of international education in Canada. So with that I will close again. It's been wonderful to connect with Carleton. I think, I hope you can see in such a meaningful way across various, um, uh, across that spectrum of engagement and we really do look forward to connecting with you more deeply moving forward. So thank you. It's, uh, as my fellow panelists have said, it's, uh, it's an incredible pleasure and privilege for me to be here. Um, I want to thank Lorraine, the, the President, and all of you for this opportunity. I will, I will get around to saying a few things about Academics Without Borders, specifically later in, in my remarks. Uh, if, if I forget, I brought along some brochures that I'll, I'll try and pawn off on you if anybody has a particular interest in, in the group. But what I'd like to do is use the opportunity, knowing that you're involved in a strategic planning process, to share with you uh, the way I've come to think about university internationalization, both as a university provost and working both at, in, in this country and at Aga Khan University, um, in thinking broadly about the issue of internationalization, and uh, obviously most recently in working with Academics Without Borders. And as you can tell from my title, The Missing Leg on the Three-Legged Stool, what I'd like to, to get you to, to think about is internationalization as a, as a piece of furniture. Um, and it, it, we probably could say four-legged, but I'll leave that out because my skills at designing furniture are limited and um, it just complicates the conversation. But there are clearly um, two legs that have already been, been talked about at, at some length, and they're very important ones. Um, there are international students studying here in Canada, and then also student mobility, Canadian students moving abroad. And you could add to that leg the quality of global experience on campuses, the internationalization of the curriculum on our own campuses, and the student experiences on our own campuses. The third one is the one I want to try and focus on in my comments, and in, as you're thinking about this in a strategic planning process, have you think about um, the, the, the role of higher education in global development, um, what I've come to think of as reaching across borders, building a better world. And it's a different piece of, of the internationalization agenda, but I think a very important one. Let me start, though, with the, the first two legs, and the, because they are important. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be critical of them. I think they're important elements, as my, my colleagues have stressed quite eloquently, I think, in their comments. We've, we've heard about the, the really quite remarkable increase in the number of international students um, that are studying at, at colleges and, and universities and elsewhere in Canada. Um, as has already been said, a large proportion of those from China and India, and if you look at the actual statistics, it, dr it dwindles very quickly after, after those countries. Um, there are a lot of important positives about international students studying here. Um, individuals from other parts of the world who might not otherwise have access to high, the high quality of education that we have in this country in really what is quite a remarkable post-secondary system internationally, they are able individually to benefit from that and, and they might not otherwise be able to. Um, it, it also uh, is a, an important source of income for the country and for our universities and colleges. And we can't underestimate that. Some of the statistics have already been mentioned. Um, Stats Canada estimates that 30% of the total tuition revenue of universities in Canada come from international students. 30%. That's probably around $3.3 billion or more a year. So it's, it's a very substantial amount, which helps sustain the universities in general, not only the experiences <coughs> for those students, but also for the campuses at large. Uh, one could, as, as as I think Paul has mentioned, one can think about where that 
or I guess it, it was Karen, would, where, where that might become a bit of a risk for institutions. Um, it's ironically one of the first things I ever did was a study on, uh, for international things, was a study on international graduate fees for CBIE, I think back when dinosaurs uh, walked the halls of universities. And this was back in the 1980s, and even then um, there were fears, and particularly in Australia and Great Britain, at the extent to which they were relying on international student fees, and that hasn't been a completely happy story, so it is a, a cautionary tale of sorts. The other uh, p positive things about international students studying here is that it is an incredibly important source of new citizens, people who come and work, and, and this is a country that not only in the past but in the present is a country built on immigrants, incredibly talented, industrious, innovative in, in, in immigrants, and obviously those who come from university educations in our universities and colleges are particularly um, uh, prime candidates, if you want, uh, to, to contribute for the, to the country and for themselves. So that in the, uh, some comments by the Conference Board of Canada, I think, illustrates that, that agenda. <laughs> International students are offered a suite of immigration pathways to encourage them to build a new life here. This makes perfect sense. They're statistically proven to be among the best candidates for immigration due to their high levels of language proficiency, good quality education that is automatically recognized by Canadian employers, and their experience working and living in Canada, which speeds up the integration process. And so these folks continue to make important contributions to a country that is thriving really because of, of our immigrants and, and a large, uh, an important part of that contribution are students who come through this and other universities and stay here. CBIE says that 60 percent of students who study in Canada apply for landed immigrant status. So it's not a small number. Even back into Jean Chrétien's days, he was talking about um, students studying here as sources of highly qualified prof um, personnel for this country. A lot of them stay here, and those who do stay here, and this is another benefit not to us, and, but a benefit to other parts of the world, is that remittances are incredibly important. The, the funds that, that immigrants um, send back to their home countries are important, really important sources of revenue for a lot of countries around the world. Perhaps sadly so in some ways, but it, it is a fact, and, and, and so those folks who stay here after an education are in some positive ways contributing in that way as well to the countries from which they came. Some of the, the more, more obvious negative things about it is that uh, it's limited in that only a relative elite of students from other parts of the world are going to be able to study in Canada. Um, if you look at the new program that's been mentioned by the Canadian government, the countries that they talk about and are targeted are ones where there is a growing middle class. And in fact, they use that language with, a, with an income that is going to allow them to be able to, to study here. Um, the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a minute about it. The average uh, uh, international, graduate, uh, international undergraduate fee for 2019, as estimated by StatsCan, is, is about $30,000 for a non-professional program. That's a huge amount of money from the countries that I tend to think about and work in now. So that that isn't going to be a solution for the education of folks in the vast majority of lower and middle income countries. Um, it's a brain drain, um, not entirely, but there is a brain drain in fact this. And on the other hand, that is people who are able to come here and, and pursue their lives in a way that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And that's a, an incredibly important thing for those individuals. But for some other countries, it can be, for some countries, it can be a real problem. I'm going to be visiting Nepal in, in a week, in, a, in a, about a month. Uh, in um, five years ago, about 25,000 Nepali students studied abroad. Um, in the most recent year, uh, the numbers are, are now at 63,000. So there's been a, a massive increase in the number of students going, going abroad. The outflow of, of cash that the, uh, the Nepali, Nepali government estimates is it was uh, now close to $500 million Canadian, whereas only five years ago it was about $175 million Canadian. So that's a lot of money for countries that, that don't have money uh, that is going out for international education. In, in making those statements, I'm not 
primarily being critical of international students studying here, but I want to draw your attention as people involved in strategic planning to the fact that we can't solve the educational problems for higher education in large parts of the world simply by having those students be educated elsewhere. And it's important that we keep that in mind. Um, not only is, is, is the, the demand for higher education ha is growing even faster in the developing world than it is in the, in the places that we know about, like Canada. And um, that demand cannot be met that way. It can only be met by universities that are on the ground in those, in those countries, increasing their capacity and the quality of their programs and giving whatever support we can to their plans to do that. There are also general economic benefits to a university being in a community. You folks know that at, at Carleton. You being here has economic benefits, it has cultural benefits, it has remarkable benefits in the Ottawa community and in Canada as at large. And again, students coming to study somewhere else only in very indirect ways has that same kind of, of benefit. So that's one big, the strongest leg of the international stool in, in Canada. Another one is student mobility, and it's something I've been involved in again and from my early days as a dean of graduate studies I was involved in trying to salvage an international exchange program that the Ontario government from the last round of conservative governments had in this country. Again, I'm showing my age. Uh, but, but they took a red pen and scratched out the uh, program between Ontario and it was the three motors, the trois moteurs of, of uh, Europe. And um, we, I was involved in trying to salvage that. Student mobility is a wonderful thing, and it's an incredible. We are doing very poorly and have done very poorly for a long time. And so we do need to get more students out. Again, if, if I can be the sort of critic and the constructive critic, I hope, is we want students to go to more places than the ones, and I know my colleagues feel the same way, than the countries that they typically go to now. We've, we've got to get involved with other parts of the world. We've got to do more in speaking languages other than English. I think we're at a huge disadvantage being Anglophones because too many people speak English around the world. So we're at a great advantage, but I would argue there are other ways that we're, we're at a singular disadvantage. So let me get to the third stabilizing leg. There's the fourth leg would be research, but I, again, it's just too much to try and deal with. But the third stabilizing leg is, is this idea of global development. And much of global aid or relief that we're most familiar with is reactive. It's the necessary responses to immediate threats from increasingly the effects of climate change to, to, to starvation to drought. Um, to violence of a whole range of kinds, from terrorism to internal conflict. There's something like 70 million displaced people around the world right now. We react to that with bringing very direct aid that saves lives, and I, and I would never argue against the importance of that kind of action. But unfortunately, too often, when that aid has been delivered, the situations that gave rise to those problems recur, and we simply have to do it again. If we're going to help, if we're going to work with, rather than help, but work with our friends and colleagues in other parts of the world, what we need to do is we need to find ways to help them develop healthier, wealthier, and more stable, more peaceful communities. Part of that, not the only part of that, is the education of political leaders, economists, people in the private sector, entrepreneurs, public sector folks, doctors, um, lawyers, uh, educators, professors, who are going to the ones who contribute in those ways, to contribute to building the kind of stable and prosperous societies that, that folks long for everywhere in the world. That's the raison d'etre of universities. Um, in addition, a lot of our aid now is for primary and secondary school and health. Again, somebody's got to teach in those schools. Somebody's got to be the doctors and nurses and, and community workers who deliver that health care, and they too need the kind of educations that you offer here, but that our colleagues in the developing world know the role that they have to play in their communities, but too often they don't have the resources to do the job that they would like to do. And that's becoming increasingly difficult for them as governments demand that they take more students into their programs and they don't have the resources to, to respond. We often feel hard done by in Canadian universities. Uh, you, you know, I know all of you know, that, that our problems pale, pale by comparison with the kind of challenges that folks are facing in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world. 
um, your colleagues there um, lead very difficult lives in general. I mean, not always, but not in all cases. But just to give you some statistics from Kenya, which is a country I'm very familiar with, um, student enrollment since 2008 to 2018 has gone up five times. During the same period, um, faculty increases went up 13 percent. In some public universities in, in Kenya, the ratios of students to faculty, uh, students to faculty is 70 to 1. We, we start complaining when it gets between 20 and 25 in this country. So the situation is one of, of remarkable need. Many fine universities uh, that, that have just entered a period where there's so few resources that they have needs in all kinds of areas, the development of basic infrastructure. That, uh, and by this, I mean human resource infrastructure. So library systems, registrar's offices, the kind of non-academic support services in teaching and learning, but also the development of new programs and taking advantage of, of information technology in order to deliver programs more easily and, and more effectively. Um, those of us in Canada are in a very privileged position and, 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 and I think have an obligation and certainly I think a, a duty of sorts, particularly in a country that's built on, on immigration, to reach out and, and partner with our, our colleagues in other parts of the world to help them create the kind of universities that they need. CETA used to, when CETA existed, used to do a lot of work in this area. Global Affairs Canada development does relatively <coughs> little these days. Um, there's, this is an area that's being neglected in the in, 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 because of so much investment going into some of the other areas I've talked about. And I won't it take me too long to get into that. But we, Global Affairs Canada needs to get more involved in this area, not to the neglect of the other things that they're doing. There's an interesting and I think promising initiative of the G7 countries starting the U7 alliance of, of uh, universities to work on five global challenges that include the role of universities in the global world, climate change and cleaner energy, inequality and polarized societies, technology transformation, community engagement and impact. I hope that that group, and I've had some conversations with them, will think about the fact that although they themselves can do a lot in partnership, they need to help their work with their colleagues at universities elsewhere in the world to be this, build the strength so that they can deal with those problems and address those problems as well. Then there's Academics Without Borders. <laughs> and Academics Without Borders is a modest, but I think very important and unique uh, institution. We do, we do a very focused number of things. It listen to the kinds of things that my colleagues do. Their, their domain and is, is as wide as all outdoors. Ours is very narrow. We basically take the kinds of needs that I talked about before, but we don't identify them. They're brought to us by our partners in the, in the, in the de developing world, say these are the projects that we need to do. We need to improve our libraries. We need to start a public health system. We need to improve women's cancer care. These are real examples that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. We then go out and link that with another amazing resource, which are people like Joy Mighty, who's sitting on the end of the, the table here, who are in incredibly qualified individuals in the Canadian, uh, largely Canadian, but also international post-secondary sector, who are willing to volunteer their time to act as expert consultants, essentially, to work with their colleagues, to build their capacity. Uh, I use the word train the trainer. That sounds a bit uh, mundane. But to, to transfer knowledge that we have through our privilege and our experience to our colleagues in other parts of the world who can then do the same thing, who can take it on and, and, and build their own ability to work there. We link those things up. We provide the resources to cover all of the direct costs. The, the most important resource is the volunteer time of the individuals. We've done, and I think I actually have a slide that says this. Um, we've done about 116 projects completed, sent 170 volunteers in the last eight or nine years. Um, and we continue to, to do this. We do this with the support of a number of important foundations. We'll be announcing a, an important uh, link up and partnership now with um, MasterCard Foundation, which we're very excited about, which is really going to change the, the, the scale of what we're able to do. Um, we have a, Canadian, an, a network of Canadian post-secondary institutions of about 23 institutions, <coughs> including Carleton. You have three more volunteers who are going to be going out later this fall. Um, and um, 
it's one way that as individuals, uh, in, a, in a modest but incremental way, we can make a real difference. And believe me, the kind of programs we've done, creating rural medicine training programs in Nepal, these things make a difference at a level that our partners are ready to work at. They identify what they want, they can do and what they need to do. So, uh, I'll just end by saying, apart from this being the right thing to do, there's an issue of enlightened self-interest, which probably doesn't take much imagination. Um, stronger and more effective universities and colleges help build healthier, more prosperous, more, health, more, more just societies uh, and more stable societies where fewer people are forced to flee as a result of uh, all of the, 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 the threats that are facing our world so, and in such a, a, a tangible and, and striking way at this time. There are those who would believe that we can protect our privilege by building walls, and we can't. Um, that it's an increasingly interconnected world. And in, by working with our colleagues, our friends in other parts of the world and stabilizing their societies, increasing their prosperity, we are ultimately doing what's necessary to preserve our own futures and, and those of, of generations to follow us. So, the idea of reaching across borders and building a better world is that other leg of the, the global of the interna internationalization stool that I think we're uniquely placed to build. And, and I hope as you think about your direction um, that you'll, you'll think about that stool as well as the other important ones. So thank you. You have a few minutes left for questions. We have some that have been shared through Quick Share. Hopefully you still have the screen open and you can pop uh, your questions up on the screen. Um, one of the questions that came in earlier in the discussion that we could perhaps start with, uh, and I'm not sure who, which one of you would like to tackle this. This is a, a challenging question. Um, what Should we ignore uh, the various anti-globalization movements that are, that are going on? Is it not, we can't, is it yes or no? Is it? <laughs> um, Very few academics can answer a question. I mean, <laughs> I think that the, the, the globalization arguments in the sort of economic and political field are complex and, and multifaceted. I do very much think we should resist any kind of, of hyper-nationalist, protectionist kind of position. Uh, I think we have to have an enlightened globalization, but we're, we have to have globalization, and it's not really a choice. That, that's, it's not, you, you can't resist the interconnectedness of, of this world. It's just not possible. We need to take control of it and make sure we craft that, 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 those linkages so that they're humane and, and in the interest of everyone, not just us. So. Sure, I mean, universities are about engagement, so to ignore that whole thread of thought would be, uh, would be folly. And, and I also think, again, if we think about the historic perspective in which we're operating right now, we've had, a, we've had a paradigm for 70 years that has done many things and left many things undone. So more people lifted out of poverty, more people have access to education. There have been some tremendous accomplishments. And frankly, Canada and Canadians have been architects of those accomplishments. And I think we're in a new period now, and it's again an opportunity for the universities to demonstrate that they can think boldly, they can think creatively, they can engage in new ways, in a way that recognizes the challenges of income inequality, recognizes the challenges of climate change, recognizes all the all the work left undone, but does it from a stance of active engagement, not from not from sitting back. And if I just may add to that. Um, I think moving, on, moving beyond just anti-globalization, I think we are seeing also a trend towards regionalization. And I think as, again, we are thinking about strategic plans, um, thinking about potential competitors, partners, um, at a more regional level, I, I think is an important consideration moving forward. So let me ask another question that sort of follows up on the distinctions in the discussion. We've, we've talked a little bit about uh, international students coming to Canada and about outbound mobility. What other forms of engagement do you think are most productive for universities today in terms of the international context? Let me put a plug in right away about international research collaboration. <laughs> you know, <laughs> absolutely. And Canada still doesn't have the mechanisms to play at scale. 
Uh, individual projects get funded in individual budget cycles, or if you're lucky, the existing granting application methods line up with an international opportunity. But let's lift our sights to think about how we play at leading global levels. And Carleton has got global leaders in a whole number of domains. How do we lift uh, their, their opportunities uh, to engage around the world? And what would be your advice for us on that? Well, part of the work that uh, Benoit and I are doing is uh, uh, trying to l leverage more funds from the federal and other governments to say, this is the world we're operating in. These are the problems universities are working to solve. And it's going to take some time and effort, but the next six weeks are an interesting time to be advancing those kinds of arguments. And I, I mean, I think it just to echo those words. And, and also, just as in, uh, not just within the universities, there's been a, a, a struggle to, be to, to recognize that applied research, knowledge transfer, is an incredibly important part of what we do in all areas. I mean, for, for a long time, Canada, I think we were thriving in the area of basic research, um, always did really well at the basic grant council, grant council individual research driven, uh, researcher driven uh, grants, but we're not doing very well at, at collaboration and knowledge transfer. We're now doing much better than we did in the past. My plug, of course, would be that I think in the international domain, this is incredibly important. There are very important but also very exciting questions out there to be solved, and I think we have to think about that knowledge transfer as being as much a part of our research um, uh, domain as, as any other uh, more obvious kind of applied work. I see one of the questions on the... Uh on the screen relates to international student supports and certainly given the increase in student numbers coming to Canada, what do you see as the most important supports for that group? Do you want to lead Karen? Sure. Sounds like yours. Well, I mean, I think that there has been a, you know, a number of areas that have surfaced um, through our, you know, workshops and webinars and ideas that have surfaced, that have been coming from the universities. Um, and those are in terms of housing, mental health has been a huge issue. Um, and I, I would see that those sort of continuing, I would put those sort of at the top of the list. Um, but really, that is um, what I mentioned are, you know, those, you know, our listservs and our online platform for the professional learning communities. Um, that's a critical area that CBI wants to become engaged in or it, sort of deepen our engagement. And we do want to work with the professionals, those frontline officials that are on the, on, you know, working directly with those international students uh, to identify what those critical uh, areas are. But uh, again, I would say mental health and housing, for sure. If I can add, just to say that, that done poorly, internationalization is extremely destructive. It's destructive to those who come. It's destructive for our own university communities. So doing it well is important, and professional best practices, <laughs> and uh, get ready for this, investing in, uh, in resources in internationalization is an important element. And, and frankly, maintaining the space for international students on Canadian campuses to make sure that we don't get pushback on our campuses. Uh, we, I've referred to some of the experiences in the United States and elsewhere where uh, the pushback has been pretty ugly. And so finding ways to make sure that international students are well and fully integrated into campus life, that they do have the supports uh, for them to succeed, that they do have the opportunities that domestic students have extracurricularly and in terms of uh, uh, community service and uh, uh, work injury and learning, that they are seen to be full members of, of, of the university community and not simply guest workers or guest students. Thank you. I know there are other questions in the audience. I'm looking at the time. Uh, hopefully you'll linger for a few minutes so that we can uh, uh, still uh, share some insights. Uh, but I'm going to call on now on my uh, colleague Patrice Smith to uh, make some closing remarks. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, this is part of uh, 
a longer um, engagement uh, with the community on um, our strategic, strategic planning process. And uh, we're grateful for your voice in the strategic, strategic planning process. And we welcome and your, your feedback and your advice as we move forward with this process. Thank you so much, Lorraine. And thank you to our guest speakers for lending your insights into the process. And um, we're very grateful that you were able to come and, and speak with us. And hopefully, as Lorraine said, you will be able to stay with us for a bit and answer a few more questions as it relates to our strategic planning process moving, for <coughs> moving forward. So we have a few little gifts, uh, presents, as is the case. So we'll start with Paul. Paul, sure. thank you so thank much you. for thank coming. You and uh, I'll try our best to get there. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and Karen, our thank Carlton you. alum. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And we'll end with Greg. Thank you thank very you. much for your insights. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Patrice. I see there's still lots of food, including uh, some kind of desserts. So please help yourself before you uh, head out and enjoy the rest of your day.